Hi, I'm Sarah from The Upcoming. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you virtually. Thanks so much for taking the time to speak with us. Absolutely. Um, so thank you so much and brilliant, love the film, Tripping with Nils Fram. <laughs> yeah. Maybe for people who don't know about this film, can you give us a brief introduction in your own words? Well, yeah, it's a film about um, a concert and you basically see me play a concert which we recorded two years ago in Berlin in the Funkhaus and it's a wonderful location. It's an old broadcasting recording studio back in the days and now uh, it's used also for concerts or it was before the pandemic. And um, we, I have the studio in this building, my recording studio, and so it feels very much like home and being able to record um, a concert there and uh, make the whole production there was a feast for us. It was a good time and we wanted to document um, a pretty ambitious tour we have done in 2018 and 2019 where we played over 180 concerts for uh, the promotion of my recent album All Melody, which was a studio work and um, we had to plan to see all the continents and to go as far as we can with a um, a pretty impressive setup on stage, which you see in the films. The stage is full with instruments, and I basically brought the studio on tour for this. Mm. And so you were doing this world tour, which I understand, you know, completely sold out some amazing locations, and then you actually returned to to Berlin to the Funk House in in the December of that year. So, what um, made you decide to want to make this into a film? Kind of, you know, put your music into this different medium. And you know, how did this collaboration come about with Ben Warren? I understand you've been working with him you know, since back in 2011. Yeah, um, well, in, in, these, in these modern times, you see quite a lot of films about you, which you never did because people have cameras and they film a snippet from the concert. Or you play a festival and maybe there's a camera team and they, they put a show online. It's normal now, like all the, all the musicians they, they find from themselves like video documents of some show or festival gig. And usually maybe there's some, some element of the show which is not working out. Maybe the sound is a little bit bad or the image quality is, is a little bit weird. And, um, and so we found that all the videos we knew were existing maybe on YouTube and, and other places where you can see me perform were mostly outdated and we wanted to gain control over the visual side of a film. So on the whole tour we did over these two years, we, we kindly asked all television to not film the concert because we wanted to try to generate a little bit of a mysterious gap in documentation so we could come out with our own more quality product of a concert film because we spent much more time and also means and money on this project than a normal BBC or any other broadcasting company could. Mm -hmm. They work very fast. Usually they spend one day on the whole thing and by the end of the night the film is ready. And uh, for us that is not, or it's not my way of working. That's yeah. And he has a, a very particular approach, I think, to the way he's filmed and produced it. I mean, we really feel like we're right there in the front row. It's very intimate, but he also, I think, believe it was using kind of handheld cameras. So it's not a sort of conventional approach to, to making a film. So what was it about his style and that, that, you, you, that made you want to work with him on this film? Well, Benoit Le Monde is also not only just a very uh, fantastic director, especially when it comes to documenting musicians. He, he worked with all the big names in the field and with really the good bands. And, and uh, I was working with Benoit already in 2011 on a series which was called Soiree de Poche, uh, based in Paris. And it it's trans translates as pocket concerts. So they, they rented tiny apartments, beautiful apartments, or uh, normal sized apartments in, in Paris, but it was like a, a tiny venue. So I played once in Paris in an apartment in front of 50 people, they recorded, recorded the show and I realized the way they, they use the photography is, is quite different from all the other concert films I've ever seen. Um, concert filming is 
a lot standardized since maybe the 70s, 80s. You have the crane and you have certain typical moves. And, and with Soiree de Poche, they were close, close up filming a lot of the action of the musicians. So in my case, they focus on my hands. And you lose orientation in the process. Sometimes you just cut from one hand close up to another hand close up. You're not sure if the hands are in the same room anymore, what's going on. So, so the hands become like a person, maybe. You know, the, the fingers are like legs. And, and, and you see maybe a person dance. And, and I, like, I like all these like weird association which come to my mind when I watch this type of film. And especially now that I realize that a lot of uh, modern documentation of art and especially music through social media and mostly YouTube has, has uh, created a style of filming which is supposed to make the camera invisible. We just want to have a straight illuminated room uh, overview camera angle so we just see the person you know through through I think social media and YouTube we 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 ignore the camera work because we want to go directly into somebody's private life and the camera is non-relevant and so we see all these for me very boring imagery and very boring photography um, which tries to make everything obvious and and so I wanted to go the opposite way I wanted to say like no uh, a film is the work of a camera and the camera uh, has possibilities to alter the reality to the better because just filming it with an overview angle is like 80% of a concert. Mm. And when, where do we get the extra 20% from which makes it worthwhile watching it? And I think you need to use the, use the um, uniqueness of the media and, 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 and tricks you have with this media. And I think this film, film experts know much more about than I do, but my father's a photographer. So I think I understand a little bit how much the lens changes the reality. And I think this needs to be used. And, and, and a lot of filming today tries to, nobody talks about the camera work on YouTube video. People only talk about the content. And yeah. I think that's, that's uh, also something we wanted to highlight maybe yeah. by doing a more film type of thing, old school. And of course, back in 2018, you could never have predicted what 2020 would be like. And I think there's something, you know, even more captivating and moving about watching this film because we haven't been able to be in a, in a gig in a room like that for so long so how does it feel to you to you know watch that back and you know I, I got goosebumps watching it so I can't even imagine what it was like be, being on that stage yourself yeah it's a strange feeling for sure it's like when you see people being so close and sitting there almost cuddling you feel like oh my god this is this is not this is not right <laughs> But um, but it also makes you very sentimental, of course. And and uh, yeah, at first when when the when the lockdown started in March, we were very discouraged discouraged with the project because it was not our not our intention to to put out something in response to this, you know. And it felt very much as a concert film was now the standard response to the new situation. So we we waited also we we worked hard on the movie we said like i don't want to we don't want to put it out in april or may or let's not rush this uh, let's think and uh because we already felt like this would take a long time and we already decided look not let's not let's not use this shot now we we probably can use it later when people are still in the same situation and um it got even more emotional nine nine months later because mm. yeah, it's uh, oof, um, it's memories it's lots of memories and and all of a sudden in this new reality i i sometimes don't know if i dreamt all of this you know mm. and, and how long how long are we in this state and and wasn't it always like this that's crazy how much the brain tricks us uh, for me it's very very strange and 
but I guess on on the other side of it, there's something incredible that even though people are locked up in their houses, you know, for the best part of this year, they can still enjoy music. And I think a lot we you see what's come out is that people have turned to art, have turned to music as a kind of respite. And particularly in your film, you see how transporting music can be. It's it's very hypnotic and mesmerizing. And you do feel emotional watching it. So how do you reflect on that sort of more generally the power of music to kind of, you know, transport people, but then, you know, very particularly in this moment in time, how it can be quite healing. Yeah, I hope that people, people um, get something out of, out of art in these days and that they have, um, yeah, that they have also the open ears and eyes still to see because I know how hard it is at home to, you can't really go to an exhibition, you know, and you, you cannot really go to a concert. You, you can mostly use the computer and I'm, I'm undecided if I think that's, that's, that's very positive or, or some, somehow also negative because I think um, if the computer uh, now replaces all these formats where we would usually maybe go to a place for, mm -hmm. then maybe ho hopefully people don't get used to that. And hopefully they also like rebel against that consuming art at home through the internet because it will, it will maybe condition people in a way that they uh, don't go out for this anymore. And I think like in the end, going out of your home and going out of your place and going somewhere else and meeting other people is irreplaceable. And, and we can only like um, maybe aid a little bit with nah, the music at home or like a film like this. Maybe it aids a little bit, but I also hope that it doesn't cause like a conditioning or shift in, in behavior of how art is consumed. And I think, you know, what's particular about your music is you do bring together this sort of classical side with something more contemporary and electronic. So how do you kind of characterize your music and, and how are you influenced in, in, in music you make? I always liked instrumental music. Um, People think I may be also a fan of film music. I love films, but I, I, as a composer, was always more impressed with people who could make their album just by themselves. For me, that was my goal to just make a record and with my band or with other people. So I characterize my music as, as instrumental music, um, which still is a way of communication, but as, as I'm often lost for words, but I have something I wanted to say that that instruments or instruments in general really help me to to uh, to express and um, it's a therapy for myself honestly and I, I i I would describe music as my emotional um, ventile because a lot of things which I'm experiencing, and people probably relate to that, they build up certain tension or friction in yourself and, and somehow you don't really know how to get this out of your system and out of your body. And some people do sports and uh, go boxing or other people go jogging and um, there is all types of ways to use this energy for something. Mm -hmm. And I always enjoyed how music or art can be a way where you can make the most hopeless, bitter feeling you would never allow yourself to put in words and tell a person because that person would be sad immediately too. It's infectious, it's not good. How an emotion like this can be turned into something which gives people an outlook which they can enjoy and uh, which maybe widens their perspective and and all this being fueled from a source which you felt like is poison mm. and and it feels like regeneration or like something we are seeking for in biology or like in environmental things how can we turn our waste into something good fruitile mm. or soil 
and you know the where the concert's based and yeah, the funk house in berlin but it's also where where your studio is do you think there's something very particular about the music scene there i mean i've been to some wonderful festivals there and you know even one site pop culture like there's something very uh, innovative and an incredible mix of people and really exciting music seems to come out of that city so what do you think it is about berlin that, that you like and that you think produces such um, amazing music well people work in a very um interesting way when you when you when you visit musicians in the electronic field mostly they have studios which are all different and i think a lot of people now work with the similar tools and a similar workflow and because of that a lot of music sounds uh, interestingly similar and when i when i look around in berlin you find all these interesting confusing studios where people mix all these interesting uh, synthesizers with other equipment and they 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 use the the cable to patch this here and and you feel like every studio is like a very personal a uh, special made instrument which produces sound only the studio can can produce and i experienced that many people here in berlin they they know how to repair synthesizers they know how to measure a tape machine they i find all the experts here when i have a broken microphone there's experts who repair the microphone and and, and you, berlin is very unique in that in that um, regard that you can really run a complicated production here and there's a lot of skilled technicians who will help you modify your synthesizer you know some people opens up my synthesizer and starts changing the inside understanding all the details about that and and uh, it's very very interesting city because of that because it's a highly skilled also technically skilled place where people um work in an uncompromising way often mm -hmm. and you hear this in the productions and and it inspires your neighbor producer to also like go for the better thing so when one one person in the city has a very good sounding studio people go there and ask like what's your secret and so you give tips and you help each other to to make the production better and it's a very open way we we, we want to help other musicians to, to to sound better as well we, we are not like ah i have a secret good sound and then tell nobody it's it's a community feel about this and i guess the, the flip side of that is cities like that and the music scene have obviously like everywhere but maybe even more so they've been affected by the pandemic I'm just thinking of all those incredible clubs you know it's got some of the best sort of clubbing scene in, in europe if not in the world how is the atmosphere there now and do you feel hopeful for the future that things can recover you know once we have a vaccine for example sure we always need to be hopeful about the future um things will recover and they they um they will change the scene the scene is very endangered right now obviously but through through funding from the government i think i ho i hope that that even the smallest particles of that scene can can survive for a couple more months and um but without that aid obviously and that is happening all over the world we need to be aware of this and we shouldn't be we shouldn't be like just hoping we need to know and understand that through this one year of not being able to work a lot of the small players in the field needed to give up and that means that the bigger names in the business i'm not talking i'm i'm also talking about the big brands the, the big institutions they of course survived this you know chanel dior versace uh, starbucks and amazon and all these big players um they can't be harmed with that but all these small beautiful enterprises all these nice new ideas and these uncompromising content driven little projects i worry about that and uh, i think yeah we need to see when there's more space because a lot of people had to give up it creates on the other hand an openness for other things to happen so we need to be patient and what do you hope the impact of, of your film to be? You know, what do you want um, people to feel when, when they watch it? 
I don't want him to feel anything. I mean, I I never thought about it. Um, if they experience if they experience the film and they and they get absorbed by it and they hopefully think it's short it's a short it feels like a short experience they might want to have again that would be the biggest uh, the biggest for me that that's that's quite amazing i I'm, I'm not sure what i'm feeling when i make my music so i would never even imagine or try to imagine what you are feeling exactly and i also know how hard it is to put into words so this is exactly why we need the film because hopefully something happens we cannot even understand or describe. Yeah. And can you tell us what you're going to be doing next after this? I mean, because then there's the live albums going out at the same time. Um, so what's that process going to be like and, and what you'll be hoping to do next? Well, right now, exactly, we have this uh, release in these times where I do Zoom interviews and telephone interviews and it's a little bit um, uh, surreal um but yeah next week we're celebrating the release and i'm working constantly on new music and uh, since i'm working for 20 or 25 years in the studio i i went through my my works and i was like my god is so much so much work i haven't released and um before i want to structure a new album or new idea I wanted to, um, before I do that, I want to just go into the unknown, into the void, because if, I, if I'm too, too fast to make a, make a, have an idea, then I limit myself before I even need to. And right now I would just like to hope that maybe I have a very good idea for a magical song tomorrow, which will tell me like, this is what you need to do. And I'm just waiting for that moment to happen where I see the sign of mm. this, is, this is your future. Mm. And how do you think things have evolved since you first started making music? Do you think you're a very different um, musician and composer than you know your debut in two thousand five? Yeah, I think I think I I became a, a performer before I was a musician who tried to perform and and in in all these years of traveling and and meeting awesome very interesting people and learning what works well on stage or what works well on tour and what doesn't work so well. I think I, I, I learned so much about myself and also I could evolve as a piano player. If I would have stayed in my comfort zone and would have always stayed in my little studio at home, I think I wouldn't have uh, gained so much experience and therefore I would have used less chances and uh, I would have probably worked less on this because yeah, it it is an incredible privilege to be able to play in front of many people and and they deserve a better concert and um yeah that inspired me to yeah take this more serious and uh, back in the days i was very playful about it and i was expecting that this would be anyways over in a blink of a second mm -hmm. And have you found this year sort of being locked down? I know some artists have found it quite liberating in a way to kind of be able to take a bit of a break, you know, out of the limelight and, and hunker down and be creative. And then other people have actually felt the opposite, that, you know, they've needed to do something different because, you know, they, they sort of didn't feel like it was the right moment to be, to be producing things. So how have you felt in lockdown? How has it affected you as an artist? Mm. Yeah, I heard I heard a lot about this. Like, great, this is so relaxing. This is awesome, and so on. And I, I felt like, yeah, might be, but we will have to make up for it at some point. You know, it's not like it's more like a it's more like borrowing money from the bank. You know, now we are borrowing ourselves time, but we sure have to pay it back in some way or the other. And and so I I didn't feel like it was so relaxing. It was a little bit. Uh, worrying that I felt like, look, we are not really sure that we're changing our attitude. I think we need to still grow and there's still like a marked mechanism, which is consumption, overproduction, and we need to produce more than we need and we need to consume more than we need. Otherwise, the whole system falls in completely apart. Corona doesn't change any of that. And, and so I found it quite naive to state how great it is to be creative in the studio and not need to be doing so much work I, I i don't think that's very inspiring for the fans to hear 
And I think it's also not fully true because we love our work mostly and I love my work and I feel like it's a privilege. And, and uh, if people want to work less and they feel like they're stressed out and if people feel like the career is getting too much, then they should take a break because they decide to, you know, mm. and uh, not because they must. Mm. And uh, I found it a little bit, I, I, I understand, I don't understand it how people would focus on, wow, so positive and uh, I, I would have liked a little bit more of a, a critique and uh, also like a, um, a discussion about what is happening there and why it was that worldwide mostly the culture has to pay for this you know and has it something to do with the fact that we as free artists have no political lobby that we are not organized has it something to do with that? Because I think so, you know, it's not, mm. it's, it's, it's quite worrying. We need to learn from this. We need to study what's happened. And for the next year, for the next two years, we need to, as artists, have something like a lobby in politics. And we need to, we need to go in there where politics is happening. And if there will be something like a crisis in the future, we need to make sure that not only a certain element of the society is paying for that. What's the first thing you would want to do if things go even vaguely back to normal? Where's the first place you'd like to play or go and visit? Um, it's a good question. The last, the last show we played was in Sydney and that was in, in December 2019 and um, well being in Tasmania and Sydney and New Zealand was such a beautiful memory. I, I wouldn't mind like uh, if there's a chance to ever go back there to even see more of, of uh, the beauty there and uh, see the people and, and feel like appreciated as I did. But it could also just be a concert in Funkhaus in Berlin. Mm -hmm. uh, the beautiful thing about music that it has no space, it has no place. It is it's happening everywhere and we just need a small place together and then we forget where we are and hopefully all the rest which is not important for for this moment and i think that's the beauty about it so i i'm very open i um i just wish that we soon go back to a time where um yeah touching or feeling the other the presence of the others um comes back to our lives because uh, it's very sad to see how many we are and how we have to hide from each other. Mm -hmm. I think aside from all the stress we're having because of this, this is just a little bit too much. And the longer this happens, the more I worry that people feel quite comfortably, comfortably about it. I hear from people, they say like, oh, I love it. I don't need to give anybody the hand anymore. And I, oh, the, the, the annoying kisses we needed to give each other in Italy and all this. And, and now I feel like, ah, guys, this is, this is weird. Like, why is this happening now? And, and, and maybe is it because of also like a vague situation of what is also like maybe, what is too much, you know, when people feel like, oh, you shouldn't touch me there or you shouldn't touch me here. And I feel like maybe uh, people enjoyed it secretly. And uh, I wish that it is possible to give somebody a smack on the butt again and be like, how are you, my friend? And uh, <laughs> to get that too, because uh, yeah, being touched and touching others is uh, I think something we all miss maybe hmm. the most and being in that atmosphere of a concert where we all breathe the same air and we all unify and become one. Mm. Um, I hope that people have no weird thoughts when they go back to concerts and be like, oh, now it's very many people here. What I might get from this? And uh, yeah, it will take some time to maybe get it out of the system. Who knows? Yeah, indeed. Well, and hopefully we can have you back in London at some point. Um, can't wait to get back in a was a big hack concert hall um thank you so much for sharing all that with us and um, yeah. congratulations on this wonderful film and your your live album that's coming out at the same time and, and best of luck with it all thank you so much all the best to you thank you sarah thanks cheers bye